for today's class. Okay, and there's also an updated, there's also, and this book is uh, available in Spanish. Those of you who read Spanish, it's available in Spanish on Amazon. Just a translation of Consoling the Heart of Jesus, which is Consolando al Corazón de Jesús. Okay, uh, so it's available in that as well. There's some cookies there somebody brought. You're welcome to do that as well. Uh, and also, here is an updated schedule for uh, the Bible study for March, April, and May. So make sure you take it. Uh, who'd, raise your hand if you don't have a schedule, updated schedule. So we'll pass these around, okay? So that you make sure that you know it. So we're having class today. We're having class next Monday. And then we, we won't have class for three weeks because it's Lent and the, there's no space available. Uh, so we don't have room. And then so we'll then have class on April 4th and April 11th. No class on April 18th. So we still have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine classes left in the year. Okay, so you'll get plenty. Okay. So today we we will be talking about mercy. We'll be talking about God's mercy for us. Sorry, Father. Is it it's not the same with the update one? It's uh, it's updated. So yeah. Matter, that one Just, uh, she'll, yeah, it's updated. Mm -hmm. She updated it. Okay, so today we'll be talking about mercy. God's great mercy. And if you have your, you have your notes, and I put there on top a new book from our Holy Father, Pope Francis, and the new book that he has written is called The Name of God is Mercy. And we are, of course, in the year of mercy. So how poignant that we're discussing mercy today and how poignant that we're focusing. This is what he wants us to focus on in the church. Mercy. God's mercy. And that God is merciful. Uh, and is, is calling us to that reflection. So if you need, I'm giving you these book recommendations. Hopefully uh, some of you are taking me up on that. Uh, how many of you are, are reading some of the things that I've recommended to you before? Okay, good. Because I don't know whether uh, it's sticking or not. <laughs> so uh, this is another one. The name of God is Mercy. It's the new book by Pope Francis. And you can or really, uh, I have found that it's better to order on Amazon than to go to the, to the publishing because they have the best prices. And sometimes the used books like this, Consoling the Heart of Jesus, you can get it for $3 because it costs you a cent, a used book, and then the shipping is like $3.99. So all you're paying for is the shipping. So you get the book for $4 where you'd have to pay somewhere else uh, $20 or something like that, plus shipping. So really, uh, I really like, um, I really like Amazon. Before we begin today, I wanted to tell you, uh, uh, speaking of mercy, next Monday, we are having class, of course, but also next Monday, March 7th, is the day of penance here in the parish, which means we're having uh, confessions all day. So make sure that you make a plan to go to confession next week, next Monday, okay? And one of the priests who's coming is hard of hearing, okay? So I know he'll have a big line. Uh, but it was interesting. Last week, I was invited to hear confessions at uh, Christ the King. And I was there in the morning time for a few hours and then I came back in the evening and there were other priests who were signed up to be there in the evening. Well, I get there and nobody's there. No other priest came. And I see all these people and I'm the only one. 
And so I sat down to hear confessions, and of course somebody sat down, and they were telling me their whole story, you know, all these. And I said, okay, well, this is not going to work. I mean, this can't work because there's just, I'm one person and there's all these people. So I stood up and I said, everyone look, look around how many people are here. You don't have to tell me where it happened. <laughs> you don't have to tell me how it happened <laughs> or with whom it happened. <laughs> Just say, what happened? <laughs> so, uh, it's a big lesson for us uh, when we go to confession as well. Uh, to confess our sins, not the sins of someone else. You know, Father, my husband, you know, okay, well, it, your husband should come to confession. Okay? <laughs> you don't, don't confess his sins or your wife's sins. Confess your own. And it's not a time for you to get uh, counseling or spiritual direction. We're not counselors as priests. Okay? We're agents of God's mercy. So then I usually refer people who need you know, counseling. I have a list and then I will refer them to people who will be happy to offer you counseling. Uh, but it's a, it's a time for you to come and get off of your chest those things that are bothering you, those things that are weighing you down. And if you haven't been in a while, it's a good thing to uh, put into practice. And on that note, we had a wonderful weekend with great weather. Wasn't it? We're very blessed to be here. And as we are reminded of how good God is to us, we'll be reminded of how much He loves us as, and wishes for us to come to internalize that love in our lives as we pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank You for this time that we have here together. We give you praise, we give you thanks, and we give you glory. And we ask for that gift of mercy in our lives, today and always, as we glorify you by saying glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we'll be looking this week at the gospel of the prodigal son. Everyone's familiar with that. It's a very famous uh, story from the gospels that Jesus uh, recounts. And it really is a story telling us about the nature of God who God is and how God is and how God treats us. And so it's in Luke's chapter 15, the uh, parable of the prodigal son, as it's called. And so Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And just listen. A man had two sons. And the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between his two sons, the younger one and the older one. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything he had, a severe famine struck that country and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. 
and he longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat? But here am I, dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, quickly bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fattened calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a party because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration began. Now the older son had been out in the field and on his way back as he neared the house he heard the sound of music and the dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, Your brother has returned and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older son became angry and he refused to enter the house and join the party. His father came out and pleaded with him. And the older son said to his father in reply, Look, all these years I have served you and not once did I disobey your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughter the fattened calf. The father said to his older son, My son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. This is a story that we have just heard about a father who loved his two children and who wished for them to love each other as well. This story is one Jesus tells in a series of three stories to the Pharisees about the nature of God after they took Jesus to task for eating with sinners. You remember the Pharisees all the time complain, he's hanging around with sinners, with tax collectors. He hangs around prostitutes. It was their major complaint against Jesus. And Jesus tells them about the shepherd who leaves his 99 sheep behind and goes in search of the one lost one. Then Jesus tells them the story of a woman who turned her house upside down looking for the one lost coin. And finally, we have this story that Jesus tells the Pharisees where he tells them a tale of a father who had two sons and about how compassionate this father is and the graciousness with which he deals with his two sons. Our problem in trying to understand this story is that we try to understand God with our own limited human intellectual capabilities. And God is beyond our abilities to comprehend. God is the great unknown. We think 
because we're religious and we think because we're in church and we think because we we know our catechism we know the rules we read the bible we think we know a lot I go to church all the time, you say, I study all the time, and you think you know a lot about God, but really, you know very little. We know very little about the Lord our God. Our problem is, is that we think we know so much. Socrates, who at his time or during his day was called the wisest man ever to live, he said something very poignant which all of us should take in. He said, the only thing I know is that I know nothing. The only thing I know is that I know nothing. I know very little. That's why I need the Lord to constantly work on me, to help me, to help my unbelief, my understanding, The reason why we cannot imagine a God who forgives everything and anything is because we are not forgiving people who forgive and forget as God does. People have such a hard time. I meet, for example, women who have had an abortion and they keep confessing this over and over again. Or people who have cheated on their spouse and they keep confessing that over and over again or people who have done something horrible in the past and they keep dwelling on that over and over again you may be one of those people that you know you look at what you've done in your past how maybe you've mistreated your children maybe you say i wasn't the best father or the best mother the best mother and the best father we have is our father in heaven God and not one of us measures up to him and so the fact that you weren't the best mother or the best father shouldn't surprise you nobody is here on earth nobody the problem is we have such a hard time moving on because we try to understand the nature of God with our own limited understanding and we say well I'm not a forgiving or a merciful person. I don't forget. I don't move on. And so it's hard for us to fathom that God forgives and forgets and calls us to do the same. It's what we need to constantly work on. And Jesus is addressing the concern that the Pharisees had here, that he's keeping company with sinners by telling them about how God truly is. God, the compassionate one, the forgiving one, the kind one, the merciful one. They can't understand the nature of God. How could God be accepting of people who have had a past or who have done terrible things? How could God do that? Because they're not accepting of the people around them who have a past or who are doing terrible things. They're not accepting. They're not embracing. And so they have a hard time, just like we do. We have a hard time accepting people in our life who have a past. And so... Hence, we look at God and we say, how could God accept me with my past, with the things that I have done? We dwell on what people did to us and how they hurt us and how they betrayed us. That's how we act as people. We dwell on that. We don't move on. God does. God forgets. I'm always reminded of the story of Clara Barton, the founder of the International Red Cross. And Clara had something horrible happen to her in her life. She recounts that in her autobiography. Her best friend, her bestie, she was real tight with her, her very best friend, betrayed her. 
And the way she betrayed her was she slept with her husband. Her husband cheated on Clara Barton with her best friend. Can you imagine the double whammy in Clara's life? Your husband and then your best friend. And then, you know, people talk. Because after a while, Clara was seen in the company of her best friend again. She was seen hanging out with her best friend as if nothing had happened. And people are, you know, people, were, people are very pharisaic. Don't you remember, Clara, what she did to you? How could you keep company with her? How come you're acting as if nothing happened? Don't you remember what she did to you? She slept with your husband. Don't you remember? And Clara looked at the people and said, you know, I don't remember what she did to me, but I remember the moment in which I decided to forgive her. I remember the moment of forgiveness. I remember the decision point. The time I said, I forgive and I won't go back. That's what God does to us. God forgives and forgets. Do we do that with one another? You know, one of the big problems we have in the church today is divorce. Lots of people getting divorced. Uh, more, something like 70% of marriages right now are ending in divorce. And when I talk to couples who are getting ready to be married, I always tell them, you know, there's no conditions that you can attach to a marriage. If you attach any conditions to a marriage, you don't have a valid marriage. When you get married to someone, you marry them for better or worse, in good times and in bad times. And you know from your life that the bad times so many times outweigh the good times. And so I say to them, you know, what would happen, for example, if your husband cheats on you. Will you leave him? What about your wife? Will you, will you leave your wife if she cheats on you? And 99% of the time, the people's answer is yes. Of course. One lady said to me, she says, well, he won't have to leave me or we won't have to get a divorce because I'll kill him. But if you marry someone thinking that if my husband cheats on me, it's over, you don't have a valid marriage. Because you're attaching conditions. I'm going to be with him if. There's no ifs. There's no ifs. It's either unconditional love or conditional love. God showers us with unconditional love unconditional acceptance and is asking us to do the same in our life with those around us that's mercy the story that I just told you about Clara Barton that's mercy mercy is not I forgive them but <laughs> like the, the person who comes and wants to talk about their ex-husband father I have forgiven my ex-husband but let me tell you about him and then they use you know then they use some adjectives you know to describe him is that really forgiveness that's forgiveness in human terms we are called to forgive in supernatural terms because God forgives and forgets we are to forgive not here but from here, from the heart. If I attach any conditions to forgiveness, it's not real forgiveness. No conditions attach. No strings attached. That's how God forgives us. Each time. For anything and everything you have done. And so yes, there is no sin that is not forgivable. The Bible says the only sin that is, not to be, that is not forgiven is the sin against the Holy Spirit. And you know what that sin is? That's the sin when you don't believe in the mercy of God. That's the sin of Judas Iscariot. We are the church of Judas Iscariot or the church of Peter? We are the church of Peter. Peter was a great betrayer of the Lord Jesus. He betrayed Jesus. But he picked himself up and moved on and God lifted him 
and didn't remember the betrayals. Judas could not, could not imagine the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, that God would forgive and forget. And so he went and he hung himself. He gave up because he dwelled on what happened. You and I are not to dwell on what happened. We are to dwell on the moment of forgiveness. That's why when we go to confession, we confess and we move on. And if you've confessed, you don't have to reconfess it. It's been forgiven. You're forgiven. You, got, you, you have bigger issues if you need to confess one thing over and over again. That's why I always say whenever somebody keeps confessing abortion over and over again, I said, you need, to, you need Rachel's Vineyard retreats. You need, a, you need to work through this. You need to work through it because God has forgiven you. The problem is you've got to move on and forgive yourself. That's harder to do. That is a lot harder to do. So, Jesus is telling the Pharisees here, stop being so busy and worried about who's in and who's out. God keeps company with sinners. And God rejoices in the lost coming back. So how do you deal with the people in your life who have gone astray? You know, you expect God to forgive you and to shower you with mercy. Do you do that? Do you, the, the people, everybody, we all have people in our life who have hurt us, who may have gone astray, who may have committed terrible things. How do we deal with them? Are we gentle? Are you gentle? You know, it's, uh, I'm, if you're, if you're, if you have a son, for example, who goes off to college, and he's gone because he's, he turned 18 and he's been promising you that once he turns 18, he'll be gone. No more of your rules. I'm out. Okay, and he goes off to college and he leads a life of debauchery. A loose life, in other words. Does all sorts of things. Tries every drug imaginable. Not only that, because he knows you don't like it, so he gets tattooed all over, okay? Gets a, a spiked up hair, okay? Walks around, you know, with his pants down, showing his underwear, okay? You've seen that? <laughs> or young ladies today, you know, they, they go around showing off their belly buttons with these uh, shirts, you know, showing off the belly button and the worst thing is when the belly button's all dirty and they, you know, I mean, it's just... <laughs> and so you have a son who goes off and who leads a loose life in college and is gone for four years. He wants nothing to do with you. And then he comes to himself. He comes to himself because of your prayers. The fruit of prayer. You've been praying for that son for so long that has gone off and he comes to himself after four years and he when he comes home what are you going to say <gasps> i can't believe what you did to yourself look at you look at what you've done look at your hair look at your tattoos look at your pants all the way down showing your boxers or whatever look at you is that what you're going to say how could you do this or are you going to say welcome home and you're going to start crying and you're going to be like, I've been waiting for you to come home. Come on in. You know, and then you take out all the best meat you've had in your freezer, saving it up. You know, make a great meal. Get him his favorite dessert. That's gentleness. That's how God would treat us. And that's how we are to treat one another. And later on, you could have a conversation. You know... I think you know that taking drugs is not a very good thing. And maybe you should not get so many tattoos. You know, maybe just stop at this point, you know. Okay. But that's, that's later, isn't it? And that's what the Pope is saying today about the church. 
We don't start a conversation in the church, people coming to church, by saying, don't do this, 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 don't do this. No. Come. Let's tell you the good news first, as you're to tell the good news to your son who's been away coming back. The good news is I love you. And I will love you unconditionally, whether you're tattooed or not. Or do you stop loving your kids when they're tattooed or when they've gone off? That's the way God treats us and is calling us to treat one another. And it's not just with your children. All the people around you. Great gentleness, tenderness. You want that from God. You know, it's like people expect from priests. People expect priests to be gentle, kind, and tender. And those who are grouchy, or jerky, oh, stop using more adjectives, they're not, they're not very appealing. You, I mean, how, you don't want to go to, the, I mean, it's like, stand back, right? Well, it's the same thing in our life. In other words, we attract more people with honey than with vinegar. And God showers us with honey, all of us. So do you forgive and forget? Or do you hold on to grudges, reliving the past, dwelling on what someone did to you? Father, I forgive my ex-husband, but let me tell you what he did to me. <laughs> Have you really forgiven? I don't think so. I don't think so. We all have gone astray. We are all sinners in, needs of, in need of God's mercy. And if we expect God to forgive us and forget what we have done, then why are we not willing to do the same? In other words, offer the same merciful forgiveness to those around us. Our God is the loving Father. The one who comes out running to you to kiss you, embrace you, and forgive you before you can get a word out of your mouth. Just the fact that you're making it there to the confessional. And so many people are so worried. I forgot to tell you this. You know, and then they'll get back in line and say, I, I forgot to tell you. You know, let me tell you. Did you, are you not paying attention? The fact that you came there, God forgives you. Stop, because we're imagining God's forgiveness to be the way we forgive. Just the fact that you're coming there is already the biggest step ever. Most of our success in life depends on showing up, our presence, us being there. While this is great news that we are hearing, it is also disturbing news to us religious folks, is it not? Because forgiveness is one of those gifts of God that cuts both ways. Forgiveness is forgiveness of sin, and sin is wrong. We always have to maintain that. There's no justification for sin. And we don't want to be good and not sin because of some punishment that God's going to punish us. You know God doesn't punish anyone. God does not punish. Life punishes us. We punish ourselves. The definition of hell is the absence of God, you being away from God. The definition of heaven is the presence of God. So when you go to heaven, you're going to be in God's presence. When you're in hell, that means you're, there's no God there. Not like there's fires and all this. That's all. None of that stuff. It's just the absence of God. And so hell is real, as heaven is real. How do we know that? Well, it's in here. It's in the Bible. But how many people live hell right now? That's the absence of God. They're experiencing hell right here. And you choose. The choice of whether to live in heaven, and we can have a taste of heaven right here when we live in the presence of God. We choose whether we will be in heaven 
forever, for all of eternity, or whether we will be without God. The choice is ours. But I don't want to be good because of some punishment. No, I want to be good because I have experienced the love of God, how much He loves me, and in return, I want to love Him. That's why I want to be good. That's why I don't want to sin, because I love God out of love. Not out of fear. Not because I fear some punishment to come. No. It's out of love that I want to be good. In order to be forgiven, someone has to have fallen short of the glory of God, sin, which we all have. This can be as simple as having failed to be kind to someone or as complicated as having killed someone. I've met lots of people who have killed people. Remember, I was a chaplain at Pelican Bay State Prison in Northern California. And in order to get to Pelican Bay, it's not that you had to kill somebody, but you had to kill most of the time inside of the prison, either a corrections officer or another inmate. Because that is a maximum security prison. The majority of the inmates there spend 23 hours in total isolation. They just get one hour out by themselves in a yard. It's called the SHU, the Segregated Housing Unit. And there, many people say, you know, oh, it must have been so hard to deal with the inmates. It was an absolute pleasure and joy. I loved it. The hard part was dealing with the corrections officers, the prison guards. That was the hard part. Because many of them, not all, viewed the inmates as less than them. Not deserving of God's mercy and not deserving of my mercy as a priest. And the hard part was, remember I was, a, I was pastor of the, of the parish there in the town, and a majority of the people who made up the congregation were employed by the prison because the prison employed some 3,000 people. It was the biggest employer in the county. And so the congregation was made up of the corrections officers and their families. And they couldn't believe that I would go and minister to the prisoners. Don't you know what they did? Some of them would say, you know, I have access to their files. I can tell you everything they did. I don't need to know, I would say, what they did. They're a child of God as you are a child of God. You have no idea how hard it is for us as people to look at someone else, somebody who, who may have murdered lots and lots of people, cut them up and say, you know, I'm no better than they are. That's hard. None of us is better than anyone else. None of us. We're not better. God views us all the same. That's hard for us to, to imagine. A correction officer has a hard time imagining that the, that prisoner is loved just as much, not any less. And yet this is the gospel. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge for all of us. Whatever the crime, very few of us would deny the possibility of being forgiven. But most of us would insist on what? On penance. That's why some people come to confession and when you give them one Our Father or two Our Fathers or one Our Father or one Hail Mary or something, they say, that's it? Give me more. I want more. Well, what do you want? Because it's hard. It's hard for us to imagine that all I would have to do is just, you know, say one glory be in thanksgiving and that I'm forgiven. That's hard for us to, to fathom. We would insist that the sinner needs to pay for the wrong that they have done. That is to say, I have forgiven, but... I have forgiven, but... Does God have a but when He forgives us? Is there a but there? No! The but is in us. 
God's offer of forgiveness comes with no conditions. You are forgiven, period. God has no memory, in other words, like you do. And God doesn't remember and call you to work on, this, on the same in your life here on earth. And God calls you to work on the same, to rid yourself of your memory if you are to be a true follower of His ways and not the ways of the world, which are the ways of the devil. God doesn't remember what you have done, so why do you remember what the people have done to you in your life? You have to work on ridding yourself of your memory. To this human attitude, the sinful human attitude, an attitude devoid of mercy, comes this story of instant forgiveness. Instant forgiveness with no strings attached. It's an extravagant love of God that both fulfills and violates our sense of what is right. Most of us are hurt by this story. When you read it, you don't know why the pain is coming to you when you, when you, when you read it. We are hurt by this story because we want revenge, payback. How could it be? How could it be that he went off and did all these things, spent, all, spent his father's inheritance on a life of prostitutes? Do you know, during that time, when you, when you ask your father for his inheritance, when do you get your inheritance? When your father dies, right? That's when you get your inheritance. And so, what was the younger son asking his old man? What was he asking? Die, he said. I want you to be dead. He was asking for his father to, to be dead. Can you imagine that? He was saying, I want you dead because I want the inheritance. I want you to die. That's what he said. And yet, the father accepts him back. No strings attached. So in other words, I have to make my husband who has cheated on me pay for what he did. Is that, is that what you're called to? And how many people, you know, marriages fall apart. It's one of the number one reasons why marriages fall apart. Adultery. Because you're not able to move on. Forgive and forget. I forgive him, but... There's no but. Either you forgive, or you don't. And Jesus says something else. Unless you forgive, you will not be forgiven. Unless you will forgive, you will not be forgiven. That's very hard. My child did this or that, and they need to do this or that in order to be back in my home. Or my son-in-law did this or that. In order for me to let him back in the house, he needs to do this or that. Or this person needs to do that or this. Is that your attitude? I forgive, but I want nothing to do with the person. If you've forgiven, you want nothing to do with the person that you have really not forgiven. We really do not forgive as God forgave unless we are willing to let go and accept the people who have hurt us as if what happened never happened. That's mercy. That's mercy. That's hard. It's, I mean, I, I, and maybe you're not there right now. That's okay too. But you got to work on that. Work on it. Mercy. That's how God treats you and teaches you to treat those around you. Now you get it why, you, you know, you're not such a saint as you thought you were. The amazing people who come and, you know, and I'm, I'm sure there's people even here, you know, when I say come to confession on March 7th. But Father, I have no sins. <laughs> I haven't done anything. Really? Well, then let's just take the statue of Mary down and put you up there. <laughs> we have the younger son here who squanders everything. And then the Bible says he came to himself. He came to himself. He comes back to himself. What does that mean, he comes back to himself? He has an aha moment. 
like that son that's been away for four years in college doing all sorts of things and then comes back through an aha moment he comes back to himself and in his head designs a confession that would get him a roof over his head and food in his belly that's why he says mm, I just want to live like my father's servant why because he's where he's in a hog pen he's living with pigs the English language just has one or a couple words to say pig that's why I like it in Spanish you know in Spanish you can say many words marrano you know cerdo puerco you know okay he's in a he's he's in a hog pen he's among pigs and that's when he comes to himself right he comes to himself and he comes home, home to live off of his brother's inheritance because remember the father divided it in half so the father now has nothing zero so he comes home and he's gonna live off of his older brother's inheritance and as soon as the father sees him coming he kills his brother's fattened calf and the party is on the father didn't kill his fattened calf because he already gave it to the older son it's not the father's fattened calf now you can understand the older brother's rage a little more and there's no extra steps between the younger sons coming home and the welcome party in other words is there penance involved is there penance in this story there is no penance or is there or am I reading it wrong I hope I'm not you know I know I'm not there is no penance there no heart to heart with the old man in other words you know before you come in you know son that you've been away for four years and getting tattooed we're gonna have a little talk here okay is there something like that here no no extra chores no go to your room for a week and think about what you've done that's what we do just a clean robe a fine ring and a pair of new sandals the father doesn't even wait for the older son to come home to begin the party the party is on right away it starts right away as soon as he sees him coming and the older brother isn't incensed by the younger by his younger brother's return or even the father's forgiveness of him he is incensed by what by the celebration in other words no penance that's what incenses him what incenses him is the father's mercy now maybe you are understanding mercy a little more today that's what incenses him that's why he's, 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 he's complaining, you didn't even give me a goat, a young goat, and for him you killed the fattened calf. In other words, the, younger, the older brother is asking, where is the moral instruction here in this kind of welcome? That's what the religious folks ask so many times. What do you mean you want a church, they say to Pope Francis, that welcomes everyone as they are? What, what, what kind of a church is that moral instruction all the way what about facing the consequences of your actions what about reaping what you sow what we see here is mercy and as Pope Francis says the name of God is mercy read that book what kind of world is this where we reward sinners while the God-fearing religious folk are still out in the field? See, the older son represents all of us who go to church, many of us on a daily basis, who do all of our prayers, who say, I've kept all the rules, kept all the rules. He represents all of us. It is to all of us that these questions are posed and God asks us another question are you envious in other words jealous because I am generous are you envious of my generosity and a lot of us are we're so envious what do you mean this person I know what they did it's like these people who come and say father do you know so and so is going to communion You don't know what they've done. I mean, let me tell you, they live with so-and-so. 
or they did. And I'm like, hello? <laughs> Mind your own business. <laughs> really? Or you know, it, it, this is, you know why? Because before, a lot of people, before they receive communion, they don't say, Lord, I'm not worthy to receive you but only enter under my roof. You know what they say? Lord, my neighbor's not worthy to receive you. <laughs> They're not worthy. And God says, no, you're not worthy. Focus on yourself, your own lowliness and unworthiness, your own sinfulness before you start pointing fingers at others. So why are you so jealous of God's generosity? Stop trying to figure out who is in and who is out. You'll be very surprised when you get to heaven who's going to be there and who isn't. You should focus on the fact that maybe just you won't be there instead of who, other people, you know. <laughs> that might be better. That's humility. Religious people are notorious thinking that they are better than others. What's the number one charge of religious people that people who are not religious say? They're judgmental. Judgmental. That's the number one charge. And it is a real charge. They don't say it about Pope Francis, do they? Oh no. We are notorious in thinking that we are better than others because we keep the rules, we go to church, do what they are, we do what we're supposed to. Religious people expect a reward for good behavior and punishment for bad behavior. And we want others to be like us. And those who are not like us will do whatever to get them to be like us instead of accepting them. It's like right now we have Lent, right? And what happens on, uh, on Fridays during Lent? We don't eat meat. Well, in this one neighborhood in the East Coast, the whole neighborhood was Catholic. The entire neighborhood was Catholic. And John moved in. And John was a Baptist. And so all the Catholics, you know, they started ganging up on him. John, you should become Catholic. You should become Catholic. You should become Catholic. It's what happened so many times. I had people from my town move in to Utah outside of Salt Lake City and everybody was Mormon and they were being pounced upon. You guys have to become Mormon, become Mormon, become Mormon. Well, we do that sometimes in the Catholic Church too. We want people to become Catholic, become Catholic. And so they were doing this to John and John finally relented as a lot of people do. You know, like, well. So John relented and went through the process and the priest brought him to church at the Easter Vigil, okay, and sprinkled him with holy water, okay, as three times, you get sprinkled three times with holy water, and you get baptized by saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, the priest did that. He did say the formula, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but he also had a little fun, as some priests do, okay, and he said, well, you were born a Baptist, one sprinkle. You were raised a Baptist, another sprinkle. And now you're Catholic, third sprinkle. Well, the following year, Lent came about. And everybody during Lent, you know, in that neighborhood, since they're Catholic, tuna casseroles. Okay. <laughs> but there was smell of steak in the neighborhood. And guess who had the steak on the grill? John. And so all the Catholic neighbors got together and said, we got to go talk to John. You know, he's new. He probably forgot. And they went over to John. And there's John standing over the steak with his holy water. And he says, you were born a cow. You were raised a cow. And now you're a fish. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a lot of self-righteousness of the older brother going around. In other words, I am saved and you are not attitude. 
Don't we have that all around us? I am saved and you are not. You got to become like me. Why are they killing each other in the Middle East so many times? Because I'm Shia and you're Sunni. So you got to be Shia. Right? So if you don't, off with your head. All the war, wars throughout history. Protestants against Catholics. Look at Northern Ireland, for example. You look at how many wars have been fought because people said, my religion is good, the way I live is good. My understanding is good. The father here, excuse me, the father here has lost both of his sons. He has lost both of his sons. Do you get it? The younger one to recklessness and the older one to a more serious fate. To a life of angry self-righteousness that takes him so far away from his father that he might as well be feeding pigs in the country. He wants his father to love him as he deserves to be loved because he has stayed put and followed orders and done the right thing. He wants his father to love him for all that and he does love him. The father does love him, but not for any of that. Any more than he loves his younger son for what he has done. He does not love either of his sons according to what they deserve. He just loves them. And here's something that we all need to understand. The Father loves them more because of who He is than because of who they are. He loves them because of who He is, not because of who they are. And the older brother cannot stand it. He cannot stand a love that transcends right and wrong. He cannot stand a love that throws homecoming parties for prodigal sinners and expects the hardworking, righteous, religious people to rejoice and party along. He can't stand it. He can't stand this and so he chooses to stand outside. Outside the Father's house and outside the Father's love. Now you get it why he's lost both of his sons? He refuses the invitation to come inside and join the party. What about you? Are you going to stand outside or come inside and party along? Are you going to be a party pooper? Are you going to rejoice and be glad at others' fortune or bask in envy? The choice to stand outside or come inside and join along in the celebration is yours. This story, I think, is more about the prodigal father than the prodigal son. Prodigal means giving or spending something on a lavish or extravagant scale. This is what the son did. But the father here is also prodigal in terms of his love. He never tires of giving his love away. The younger son's recklessness cannot deflect any more than the older son's righteousness. They are all a family in the mind of the father, and a party for one is a party for all. The older son here is invited not just to a relationship with his loving father, but with the wayward brother. You get why you need to make peace with your brother? What does Jesus say when you come to Mass? When you come to the altar and you have something against, you have, you're holding a revenge or you're holding a grudge or you have unsettled business with your brother, leave that offering there and go. Reconcile with your brother and then come and give me honor. Then come and give me honor. That's what we are called to do. It's an invitation to recognize his own lostness and foundness. The story ends with the older brother standing outside listening to the party inside. And Jesus leaves it this way on purpose. Does he not? It's up to each one of us to finish the story. Each one of us. Are we willing to see all people as our brothers and sisters? All people. Equally deserving of the Father's love and mercy and thus be united to each other only by the relationship to one loving Father who refuses to give us the love we deserve, but 
cannot be presented from giving us the love we need. That's the Father we have. So, I want to now focus on something before we end this morning. The, I want to focus on the idea of grace. We are saved by grace. God's grace saves us. Not by anything we have done, but and we are here because of, of God's grace. And then that grace moves us to works. That's why works are so necessary. Meaning we have to put our faith into action. That's why you have to be merciful. The Bible says here, he came to himself. That's the moment of grace. He's in a hog pen with no decent bed. And he's working for people who do not care where he came from. He is disconnected from everybody who would want him to be better. He's away from all the people who love him. He's in a far country. He's in a far country. And he's surrounded by people who love having him there in the hog pen beneath his values. Why? Because this means they can use him and abuse him. So this means what? For him to change, for the younger son to change, he had to want it for himself. Because he's surrounded by people who want him to remain in the hog pen. He has to want it for himself. Sometimes we are surrounded by people in our life who want us to be satisfied by being beneath ourselves. Who want us to be content living in a hog pen. You got to want it for yourself. Sometimes we are surrounded by people who would do whatever it takes to keep us from getting better. Because for us to get better would magnify their laziness. That's why people are jealous all the time. You know, they don't want you living in a better house, having a better car, having a better job, coming to yourself, getting counseling. It's like, the, I, I know this very well, you know, I've lost a lot of weight and I don't want to eat when I don't want to eat. I don't want to eat bad things. I know what I want to eat, basically, okay? And I know how much I want to eat. And some people can't stand that. Eat! <laughs> I don't want to. Somebody took me out to a buffet one time and, and I had what I wanted to eat there at the buffet. And then they're like, you're not going to eat anymore? I'm like, no. But it's paid for. <laughs> Here's your 10 bucks. Okay, and leave me alone. I didn't do that. But you, you get what I'm trying to say? You got to want it for yourself. In spite of the people around you. Who may be satisfied having you the way you are. How many, you know, women have a hard time losing weight because their husbands are all the time saying, no, I like you the way you are. You know, I like a little meat on, on your bones. Why? Because of their insecurity. Because they think if the, if the woman looks better, you know, that uh, she's going to leave him. Because he's insecure. It's his problem, not yours. You know, that happens all the time. So the people this young man here is surrounded by would do all they can to keep him as he is so that they could use him. You got to be able to change for you despite of who doesn't want it for you. You have to want to change. And some of us have people around us who don't want us to get better because the minute you get better, you are no longer dependent on them and you are no longer addicted to their assistance. Oh yes, you are no longer defined by them. You have to get to a point where you say, I don't need your approval, I'm going to lose weight. I don't need your approval, I'm going to get counseling. I don't need your approval, I'm going to get a different job. Because I don't like it, the one I'm in. I don't need your opinion, I don't need your validation. I came to myself. And I see what I need. I came to myself. We come to ourselves through grace, through an aha moment. 
The Bible says here, the boy said, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, does that mean that he's not the son of the father? It doesn't say here, I am not your son. It says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So that just because I have issues doesn't mean that that changes my identity. Do you get it? Just because you have issues, you have a past, you've done things, it doesn't change your identity. You are still his child. No matter how much dirt I have on me, I'm still his child. Do you get it? No matter how much of the manure I have acquired in the hog pen, I'm still his child. The good news today for all of us here is that no matter what our issues are, no matter what our struggles are, no matter what you have done and what you are going through, you are still his child and he's your father. You still belong to him. With all the dirt on you, all the manure, you're still God's child. Now I want to call your attention to something else here. Mm -hmm. When did the younger son come to himself? When did he have his aha moment? When did he come to himself? When he's broke. The Bible says here he's broke. He left home with a lot of money. But now he has no money. And he's able to change. Broke. He's able to change. In other words, you don't need money to change or be better. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm messing up every prosperity preacher in this country because, you know, the prosperity gospel where people say, you know, you, you're going to be rich, you know, and it's so popular in this country especially. I'm messing them all up. You don't need money to change or be better. Money can't make you who you are supposed to be. I don't have to be rich in order to get better. I don't have to be rich to be his child. I'm his child broke or rich. I don't care how much money you get. It can't make you who you're supposed to be. In other words, become a, million, a millionaire. And this is a real problem. Did you see how many people, I mean, you couldn't get out of Las Vegas, people on their way when that jackpot was a billion dollars or so. You couldn't get out. The 15 was all plugged up. All these people going, because I'm going to change. My life's going to change when I become a millionaire. You know what? Become a millionaire and you still won't know who you are until you know you are his child and he's your father. You can be broke, but give him glory and praise because you don't need money to know who you are. The boy is broke and says, I know who I am and I am better than this. I am better than the hog pin. How many people spend all their time in the mall trying to buy their identity? Mm -hmm. That's why your closet is so full. And then you say, I don't have anything to wear. <laughs> How many people buy name brand clothes thinking they will become somebody when in reality all name brand is is an advertisement for someone else's creativity? Mm -hmm. How many people spend all their time figuring out how they will become rich in order to become somebody when you are somebody right now, right here, just the way you are, because you are his child. He doesn't come to himself until he's broke. Did you notice that? He doesn't come to himself until he's broke. Sometimes God has to allow you to be broken in order for you to come to yourself. Now you get it? God doesn't break us. Life does. God doesn't punish us. God doesn't inflict pain on us. Life does. God permits brokenness to happen. Why? Because so many times some of us are too high on ourselves. We think so highly of ourselves. Mm -hmm. My grandmother used to say, you're smelling yourself. Mm -hmm. And some of us have that problem. We smell ourselves. You think you're the last Coca-Cola in the desert. 
So God says, I have to allow you to be broken in order for you to discover that I am the one you really need. Now you see why you've gone through what you've gone through, which if, or you're going through what you're going through. The father felt compassion, did he not? The text here says, and this is revolutionary. When I discovered this, and that's why I saved this for the last, because I save things the best for the last. Mm -hmm. oh, this is going to revolutionize your view of God I, as it did mine. The father felt compassion, the Bible says. And the Bible says the father sees the son in the distance, does he not? And he runs to him. But before he runs to him, he feels compassion. Not compassion because he saw his son looking like a mess because he's been in a hog pen and he's got a lot of manure on him. Not my poor son, no. Oh. No, the father feels compassion because of what's about to happen to him. Let me explain something to you. This is the culture of the Hebrew people. This is a Hebrew town, a Jewish town. In that culture, the law said that if a son was coming home after disgracing his father, and he, he what? He took his father's inheritance. He wished his father to be dead. He squandered it on prostitutes. The law said that the elders of the town, who are the elders? The religious folk. All the Pharisees, they were the elders. All the righteous people. The elders would line up. That's what the, that's what the law said. The elders needed to line up because as he was coming, they could see. The elders would all line up and throw stones at the son that's coming back. Throw stones at him. Stone him to dead. To death. Stone him. The elders would line up. That's why the father sees him in the distance and runs. He runs. Because he wants to protect his son. And that's why also the Bible says what? He put a robe on him. Why did he put a robe on him? To cover him. So that when the stones fell, when the elders were throwing the stones, and they were, they, because that's what happened, when the stones fell, who did they hit? Who did the stones hit? They hit the father. The stones hit the father. The father covered him. That's why the Bible says he put his cloak on him. He covered him. He took him, his cloak off and put it on him. He was exposed. And as the elders were throwing the stones, they hit the father. You're covered, in other words. That's the revolutionary moment today. You're covered. And so do you know why you should rejoice today? Because every sin you did should have had you stoned. Should it not? Every mistake you ever made should have had you stoned. But the good news is that God covered you so that nobody could hurt you. You're covered. He covered you so that nobody could mess with you. He gave you a ring so that you would know you are royalty. That's why in baptism we say we become priests, prophets, and kings. You are royalty, heir to the promised kingdom of God. In other words, I know who I am because He covered me. And every time you see me, you can't see my dirt. You can't see the manure. Because He gave me a robe and it has it covered. God covered my sins, my mistakes, my errors, my bad thoughts, my bad attitudes, my wayward ways. People don't know your dirt because it's behind your robe. You're covered. 
In other words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you today because you've covered us, all of us. And so we rejoice today in that we are your sons and your daughters, beloved sons and daughters, showered with your unconditional love and acceptance and your great mercy. And as we go out, we will recommit ourselves, O oh Lord, to work on being agents of love and mercy to a broken world and to all those around us. And we glorify you now and forever as we say, Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And may the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and thank you for coming. Come next week.